Okay, thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to the latest Duke Media Briefing on the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Gregory Phillips with Duke Communications. Figures from the Labour Department this month show prices rising at a rate not seen for 30 years, prompting fears of a period of sustained inflation. Those increase, increases are already being felt in checkout lines at grocery stores across America and beyond. We have two Duke economists with us this morning to discuss the various drivers of rising prices in these unusual times, along with some of the effects we can expect to see if inflation continues into the new year and how the ongoing emergence of a new, of a new COVID variant could complicate matters further. With us today is Emma Raziel. She is Associate Chair and a Professor in the Department of Economics at Duke's Trinity College of Arts and Sciences and Teaching Director of the Duke Financial Economics Centre. Professor Raziel's work but focuses on behavioural finance. Good morning to you. Good morning, Greg. Nice and, to see uh, you. Professor Connell Fullenkamp will be joining us in a moment, but we'll come back to him. Uh, in the meantime, um, Professor Raziel, we'll start with you. Uh, what are some of the um, ways we should expect inflation to affect day-to-day -day life? So, um, Greg, a lot of it is, is about uncertainty uh, and, and how difficult it is to plan when you don't know how prices are going to change over time. So um, if people are concerned, uh, you know, we saw a lot of uh, hoarding and shortages last year when there were concerns about things like toilet paper and so on. Um, so that was a pandemic driven response, but you, you may see something similar in an inflationary environment. So for non-perishables, if people are worried that the prices of those are going to go up a lot and they're essentials, people may um, stockpile them. And of course, that has the impact of creating a, a, a vicious cycle as, as it becomes harder and harder to buy them. And, and that can also drive prices of those up. Um, other ways in which we may see uh, changes if prices are going up on, on day to day essentials, um, you know, employees will push for um, for higher salaries because they're just their cost of, uh, you know, rent and food and other essentials is going up. So they need more money to pay for it where possible. Companies will try to push at least some of those wage hikes into higher prices for consumers. And, and again, this creates a, a, a vicious cycle. Um, one of the things that I think people have not talked about a lot, but is important to consider is for many people in the economy today have not lived through a period of inflation. The last time, as you mentioned earlier, the last time we had significant inflation was back in the 1970s. So most people living and working today have always seen price levels stable with you know, very small increases over time, just as their salaries have gone up over time. Um, dealing with a world in which prices are going up a lot and people don't know how to think about it or plan for it is going to create even more uncertainty. Uh, just in people's day-to-day -day lives. Sure, absolutely. Thank you very much uh, for that. It looks like we have uh, Professor Fullenkamp joining us now. So I'll go ahead and introduce him. He is uh, a professor of the practice and director of undergraduate studies in the Department of Economics at Duke's Trinity College of Arts and Sciences. And he studies uh, financial market development and the regulation of uh, financial markets. Uh, professor Fullenkamp, um, can you hear us? I sure can, sorry about oh. that. I was having a little trouble signing in. No problem at all. It happens. We're all used to dealing with, uh, with technical details over the last, uh, last couple of years. But so uh, we just heard from Professor Raziel on, on some of the kind of day to day effects uh, of inflation. Uh, and Absolutely. now you're with us. I'm wondering if you can talk to us and um, kind of back up and talk to us a little bit about some of the factors that have been driving inflation in the last few months. Yeah, absolutely. So in the big picture, we usually think that inflation is driven on the demand side, usually uh, oftentimes by excessive monetary policy when monetary policy gets too loose. In this case, what we've got is both supply and demand factors going on. On the, uh, on the demand side, of course, we, have, we do have monetary stimulus in response in part to the pandemic and in part to ongoing monetary stimulus stimulus that's been a part of the, of the uh, financial landscape for really over a decade or more. Uh, in addition to that, of course, we had the massive fiscal stimulus that took place uh, with the Biden administration's response to the pandemic, literally trillions of dollars being spent and put into the American economy, uh, families getting checks, uh, businesses getting support for their employees, and so on. And so between those two things, we had just an absolutely outstanding amount of aggregate demand being increased. 
At the same time, of course, everybody's familiar with the problems on the supply side. We have supply chain issues because uh, all the goods and services either can't get produced or in, they're in the wrong place to get into the consumer's hands. At the same time, we also have had uh, an unprecedented departure from the labor force. So a lot of people have basically stopped working. They've, uh, in some cases, permanently. In some cases, they're just sitting on the sidelines waiting for things to get better or waiting for better opportunities. So we have both supply and demand factors that both are moving in the direction that pushes prices up. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Both of you very much for those uh, introductions. We've certainly got a lot to dig into there. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions now. Thanks to everyone who submitted questions in advance. You can post questions via the Q&A window at any time, and we'll ask them out loud. And if you'd like to ask your question in person, raise your hand in Zoom, and we'll unmute you when your turn comes around. If you happen to be calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Thanks also to everyone watching on YouTube. Um, we've got some previously submitted questions uh, to start us off with. Uh, as we know, the Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell is appearing before the Senate Banking Committee this morning. Uh, and one of the things he's expected to talk about is how the new, uh, newly emerging Omicron variant uh, could complicate the inflationary picture. Um, so, Professor Fullenkamp, um, let's stay with you uh, for right now. And, and what, what can you tell us about how you might expect that variant, even though we don't know much about it right now, uh, to affect the current situation? Well, I think it's going to do two things. First, it's going to give us a little bit of short-term relief from inflation because we've already seen markets reacting in kind of a classic uh, uncertainty mode. When markets go into an uncertainty mode, they start to uh, plan for a worst case scenario. And one of the things they've done is they've actually assumed that uh, demand for things like oil and other energy forms are going to go down. So we've already seen the prices of some energy go down, and that might actually give us a little bit of short-term relief in terms of inflation. Um, uh, the price of oil, for example, is down uh, just below $70 a barrel when, in fact, it had been above 80 So that's a good example of one of the things that it's done. So I think in the short term, we might get a little bit of inflation relief, but it actually might prolong and postpone the eventual recovery of the supply chain. So there's there's I think bad news for the longer term, we were hoping that the supply chain issues that were, were feeding some of the inflation would get resolved quickly. But with the rise of Omicron, one of the things it could do is both uh, suspend production in different parts of the world and also continue to gum up the supply chain even worse. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Professor Raziel, anything uh, you'd like to add to that? Uh, yeah, I think from, from the demand side, um, if if there are uh, potential lockdowns or just slowing down of uh, community activities. Um, as Connell said, that that could potentially put a little bit of a break on inflation as um, you know, people are purchasing less in, in certain sectors of the market. But one of the things that we might see, what we saw in 2020 um, was a sort of bifurcation where certain types of companies that sold essentials uh, actually had huge amounts of demand and uh, prices went up as well as companies in the technology space because they were responding to the enormous demand in uh, technological services for people who were working at home. You know, on the other hand, there are other areas of the economy, transportation, um, entertainment that did very, very poorly um, as people completely stopped making use of those kinds of goods and services. And we may see a recurrence of that, um, that, uh, you know, once again, it creates this kind of bipolar effect where some companies do absolutely fine and in fact can't hire enough people and, and other companies find themselves in significant difficulties. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. And Professor Razia, we'll stay with you a moment. In your introduction, you talked about um, uh, the potential for people uh, increasing demand for non-perishable goods and hoarding those kind of things. I'm wondering about the fact that we're in the holidays, which is obviously a peak spending season uh, for people anyway. Could that actually have an effect on the longer term inflationary picture or just because that's an annual bump that we always see in spending? Is it not likely to have uh, any kind of longer term effect on, on the economy? Um, so, so really hard to answer that. And that's because uh, many things have been changing over the years outside of, of COVID um, to do with the way people that purchase people purchase in the last sort of month and a half of the year. You know, more and more people buy stuff online, uh, more stuff is available online. That also spreads out the timing of people's purchases for the holidays because it's so convenient to sort of order in advance and have it delivered. Um, and then also people are concerned about supply chain. So 
They are probably thinking more in advance about, you know, presents, gifts that they want to buy and so on. Um, Black Friday, historically, you know, a, a huge spending day of the year. Um, Black Friday clearly did better in 2021 than it did in 2020, but was probably somewhat muted relative to 2019 and previously. And again, we don't know how to disentangle that that one day and short period bump that we normally see, which parts of that are changing because of online shopping in general versus because of people's concerns about the economy and about their wallets. Sure, absolutely, thank you. Professor Mullenkamp, I see you nodding. Is there anything you wanna add to that or should I move on to my next question? Well, I think one of the things to keep in mind is that um, households are really pretty flush with cash uh, relative to where they have been in the previous few years. And in addition, a lot of households were able to pay down debts uh, during the pandemic, again, because of stimulus packages. So I would I would just piggyback on what Emma was saying and bring up the fact that uh, even post holidays, I think we're going to find a lot of families have uh, excess cash or actually room to borrow. And I think that's going to continue to uh, pump up the demand uh, going into the future. I, I don't know how long that's going to last. A lot of people have been speculating uh, that um, this can persist for several months, if not well into next year. And it's tied again to the, this, the labor market situation. A lot of uh, observers are believing that when families uh, are exhaust some of, these, some of this extra cash that they've gotten through the pandemic relief programs, then a lot of people will return back to work. Um, if those two things happen, then we could see some significant uh, easing of some of the inflationary pressures into next year. But nobody really knows what that's going to happen. And I think uh, given the numbers that I've seen, you know, uh, well over a trillion, a trillion and a half dollars were saved. Uh, by households out of the stimulus package, that's a lot of money, and uh, that can that can uh, keep households uh, spending for uh, for quite a while. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Professor Mullenkamp. Staying with you, you mentioned uh, when I asked about the Omicron variant that we've already seen a bit of a reaction to the uncertainty that, that could kind of help the inflationary picture. If um, we, as we were talking about short-term bumps, if as it you know everybody's hoping the Omicron variant doesn't become dominant, doesn't kind of uh, return us to square one or anything like that, will that bump that we've seen of uncertainty not actually make any difference longer term? It would just be, get swept away, or, or does the difference that we're seeing right now, just as a result of that uncertain reaction, actually help, even if it's only short term, um, help prevent inflation from getting out of control? I, I, th I think we might it, it might get overwhelmed, especially if, if Omicron turns out to uh, not be not be as uh, dangerous as some people are fearing. Um, and, and certainly um, that's going to be compounded by the picture that's going on in other countries. Uh, there there have been some pretty strong reactions, some pretty strong lockdowns already in parts of Europe and Africa. And so um, that could that feeds into the global picture, of course. And so I think that it, it could be very likely that if if this is resolved quickly, we could just go back to business as usual and and be facing this higher inflation. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Professor Raziel. Uh, we know that um, historically inflation tends to drive up interest rates. Uh, would we expect to see that in this slightly more unusual environment? And if so, what would be some of the kind of everyday effects of higher interest rates in this in this economy? Yeah, and it, and if we do in, move into a more inflationary environment, you know, higher interest rates, unfortunately are absolutely inevitable. Um, and um, some of what we see coming out of that, you know, interest rates, the level of interest rates uh, drives, drives borrowing. So um, if interest rates do go up a lot, we'll see it hard, it makes it harder for the consumer to borrow for items like, you know, buying a house, buying a car. Um, the other, you know, if interest rates go up, um, People's savings accounts, uh, interest rates may go up on their savings accounts, but maybe not as much as inflation goes up. Um, so that somewhat depresses the value of people's savings accounts. And then they worry about, you know, where should they invest that money? Um, so, um, you know, between those two factors, um, you know, reduced ability to borrow and uncertainty about where to invest savings, once again, that just feeds into people's uncertainty about how to plan for the, the short to medium term. And, and Connell's point about people having a lot of, uh, you know, available cash and they don't want to keep it in savings accounts because they see it eroding. That could potentially, uh, as Connell was saying, you know, drive people to, to purchase a lot more stuff. And, uh, you know, again, the negative of that is 
that increased demand can push up prices by suppliers, which again feeds into the inflation picture. Sure, absolutely. And I'm going to come back to to the point about I know that there are lots of people that have been fortunate enough to be able to work from home and and, uh, do have more um, discretionary income right now. And then, of course, there are a lot of families that don't. And I'm going to touch on that shortly. But Professor Razio, you mentioned mortgages and Professor Fullenkamp, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about housing and how this inflationary environment could affect the housing picture um, over the next 12 months and beyond. Sure, I'm happy to I'm happy to jump in first, unless Emma wants to take it. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. Uh, so the, the 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 housing picture is, you know, we've we've had a massive run up in, in housing prices already, right? The the numbers are somewhere in the order of twenty percent year over year in twenty twenty one. Of course, that uh, is caused by a number of factors, but including the the fact that a lot of people who were lo- in lockdown realized that they wanted more room, they wanted to move out of the city and into the suburbs. Uh, and you couple that with, uh, again, the, the rock bottom interest rates, and it's been, uh, for many people, a really good time to buy. Um, that, unfortunately, it looks like is going to continue. Mortgage rates are still basically in the seller. We've really never seen mortgage interest rates this low. Um, there still seems to be a lot of demand uh, for, uh, for new housing. Um, one of the things that's been uh, complicating the picture, of course, is that the, the supply of new housing has not kept up with the demand. And so that might uh, serve to keep pr- the price momentum going there. Um, one of the complicating factors that we're going to see in the inflation numbers themselves is not the price of houses, uh, because those don't go into the inflation numbers, but we do see the price of rent going into the inflation numbers. And given the way that the rental numbers get factored into the inflation numbers, we're just beginning to see the big pickup in rents that basically are following the housing numbers up. Those are just starting to get into the inflation numbers. So what we're going to see over the next six months in particular is an increased pressure on the, on the headline inflation numbers that are really coming from the fact that um, the, the statistics are catching catching up with the facts on the ground about the fact that rental prices have gone way up. Thank you very much. And, and Professor Razio, like following on from that, we're seeing, especially in, in markets like locally here in the Triangle, as Professor Villenkamp said, you know, prices have just absolutely exploded and they were even higher as a base level. Um, it seems like this is only going to make it more difficult for people to get on the housing ladder. And then with rents like increasing, I mean, do we, with this inflationary environment, do we potentially see like a housing crisis coming? I and mean, we've seen other parts of the country, like in the tech area of San Francisco, where things are really exaggerated, you know, um, uh, massive amounts of people entering homelessness. I mean, do, could this inflationary environment put us on a housing precipice in that regard? I think a a precipice is probably um, too strong. Um, There is, there will be supply, more supply coming into the markets, as Connell was saying, supply has not been able to keep up with demand, but um, supply of housing happens over a a reasonably long timeframe. So I think there will be more supply of housing. Um, Demand for uh, larger houses in suburbs, as Connell was talking about, uh, that may soften uh, as in an inflationary environment, as we said, interest rates are going to go up, which will push mortgage rates up, which at the margin will slow down people's demand for mortgages. So I don't think a, a, a crisis of available uh, places to live is, is absolutely in, imminent, because if we do go into an inflationary environment, um, the recent upswing, uptick in, in housing prices across the U.S., I think will will stabilize. Uh, and, and that could be, you know, one of the benefits of this of this situation. Sure, absolutely. Um, Professor Vollenkamp, bouncing back to you, are we in a situation where as, as, if, uh, if inflation does continue, that salary increases that aren't, you know, at or above inflation are essentially pay cuts. I mean, when we when we think about, you know, families that um, that haven't been able to kind of, you know, accumulate any savings over the course of this, um, are we uh, are we looking at potential real hardships? As Professor Razio mentioned in her introduction, we haven't seen a sustained period of inflation, obviously, for several decades in the U.S. So people are not familiar with it. I mean, um, I'm not wishing to uh, to ask you to kind of doom scroll here, but I mean, are, are regular families potentially facing a period of, uh, of relative hardship compared to what we've seen recently? Right. Well, unfortunately, the news is, of course, that the, the high inflation really did unravel a lot of the wage gains that we were seeing uh, up to uh, the pandemic and actually in the, in the early parts of the pandemic. So in 
real terms, the purchasing power of many families has actually gone down, despite the fact that they've received uh, fairly significant wage increases. You know, we have wage increases uh, on the on the, at a pace of three, three and a half percent, which was really unusual for the past decade. And and uh, about of high inflation that's at five percent or six percent comes by and unravels that rather quickly. And and moreover, it does the damage at, in exactly the places that uh, low income families are most vulnerable. Right? We see energy prices increasing. We see rent prices going up. We see prices at the grocery store increasing. So it is really well known among economists that inflation is uh, especially bad because it hurts the folks at the lowest end of the, dis the income distribution the most because they spend their money on the things that are most vulnerable to inflation. Now, um, having said that, I think um, uh, one of the things that we're really watching uh, in, in the big picture is to see whether these kind of cost of living adjustments that we used to see in the 70s, 80s, into the early 90s are going to make a comeback. Um, one of the big news stories the past few weeks was the fact that uh, a couple of the big union uh, wage contracts had been negotiated, like John Deere uh, out in the Midwest, actually did include uh, room for uh, automatic cost of living adjustments. And if those catch, catch back on, you know, the good news is that uh, people will be better protected. Uh, the bad news, of course, is that that tends to start to feed into what we call a, cl a classic wage price spiral. Um, in Over long periods of time, it's, uh, it's an unfortunate truth that wages uh, really never quite catch up to inflation, at least uh, not in the short term. Understood, thank you. Uh, we've got a raised hand uh, among the audience, so we're gonna, we're gonna go to that now. Um, Mr. Whitaker, you are unmuted, so please go ahead and ask your question. Mr. Whitaker, are you there? Are you aware that you're unmuted? Okay. Uh, we may have lost him. We'll uh, we'll give it a couple of minutes and circle back around. Um, but in the meantime, um, oh, sorry, are you there? No, no? okay, I'm gonna move on here. Uh, so we just had, um, we're in the process of seeing this infrastructure package that's been passed. Um, but we also know that a lot of borrowing that goes on is amongst local governments uh, using bonds to raise money for capital projects. And obviously this is something the government's looking to encourage right now, but will the potential inflationary environment and higher interest rates actually make it more difficult? What would we expect to see in terms of how um, the inflationary environment could affect the, um, the impact of the infrastructure package and just local spending more broadly amongst local governments? And I'm well, sorry, I didn't direct that to somebody. So the first <laughs> point, go ahead. Sure. Well, you know, when you talk about infrastructure, um, certainly there these are big uh, capital intensive investments, but they also use a, a whole lot of labor. And I think that's you know, on both sides. Uh, the inflation picture is really uh, going to eat into what you can buy in terms of infrastructure. Now, the... Um, most people believe that once we commit to an infrastructure project, we're going to we're going to actually see it through, of course, which is a good thing. Um, but they may proceed a lot more slowly. Uh, it uh, we may we may see some sticker shock at the at the local level for infrastructure, and um, unfortunately, that tends to drag these projects out. And some economists really point out that when the infra when the infrastructure project is is underway, so when you're when you're tearing up uh, part of the freeway to make it bigger, uh, you actually cause a lot of congestion that actually might uh, feed into production uh, and distribution bottlenecks. So um, it, it's 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 a really interesting catch twenty two. We we need better infrastructure, uh, both you know in the triangle and throughout the country. But getting there is is a costly process and and a time consuming process. And in the short run, it actually might uh, it might tend to increase price pressures locally and uh, nationally. Sure, absolutely. Uh, Professor Raziel, behavioral finance is something that you study. And one thing we're seeing at the, the kind of regular level is that used cars, for example, are uh, a lot more expensive because there have been less new cars available. I myself got some sticker shock when I had to buy a used car two months ago. Um, what I'm wondering is, you know, it, it, it appears that maybe people are wanting to kind of hold off because they are hoping that prices will drop. But do we have any sense from the current supply chain issues whether the supply of new cars will pick up or whether we should expect prices of, of vehicles to drop? Uh, or is that just part of the on ongoing uncertainty that we've got right now? Do we know anything? Um, I think it is part of the ongoing uncertainty because there are, you know, pressures that are keeping those costs high. You know, we all know it's a su you know, supply chain issue and components of, of new cars are held up um, so that the actual building of new cars has been slowed down. The factories can't pump out as many new cars. And of course, that then trickles down, as you said yourself, into the used car market um, to the extent that, that there's 
if there are if supply if demand from consumers comes down because those who want to buy cars on finance packages and those packages are going to be more expensive if interest rates go up. So the month of the, the, the payments on buying either new or used cars become more expensive. So that that could actually uh, soften the, the problem of supply of both new and used cars because the demand comes down. Sure, absolutely. That makes sense. Um, we've got a question in the Q&A here, um, and Professor Fullenkamp, I'll come back to you, and then Professor Raziel would like to hear from you. Um, uh, so some economists are blaming Congress, uh, the White House, for, for the inflation we've got. How much blame lies you know, with, uh, with the government um, in this inflationary environment, and how much of it is just that these various economic factors that are out of any one body's control? Well, I, I hate to use the word blame, but I think we, we have to go back and remember that um, a lot of the inflationary pressure is coming from the demand side. So that includes the stimulus package and packages that were passed. Um, I, I hesitate to put blame on Congress because at the time that they were making these decisions about spending money, they, they knew very little about the actual uh, economic effects of the virus and uh, lockdowns and how long they would last. So they had to make a, a, a really tough judgment call back at that time. And it's, uh, you know, in retrospect, sure, they, they, we can go back and say, oh, yes, they overdid it, but that's really Monday, that's, you know, that's Monday morning quarterbacking. Um, so I think, I think our, our best call is to try to think about how we can, uh, how we can go forward with this uh, instead of passing the blame around, honestly. Absolutely. And, I, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, potential solutions because, Professor Raziel, I wanted to ask you, you know, regardless of where we assign blame or responsibility, what can policymakers do in this environment to prevent inflation from spiraling out of control, if anything, given that there are so many variables right now? Um, well, so going on from what Connell was saying, you know, when we were coming out of the Great Recession, 2009, 2010, 2011, um, U.S. government policy was to, to add money to the economy to sort of spend our way out of the, um, the financial recession. And in fact, that worked really well, whereas um, the approach in Europe, who of course were equally affected by the, the Great Recession, um, their policies tended to be more on the austerity side. And as a result, it took, the, it took Europe a lot longer to come out of that negative economic period. So the the learning from that, the message from that is uh, stimulus works better than austerity for bringing us out of a financial crisis. And I think that has had an impact on policy. Um, you know, once again, it's so, it's so hard to stay because stimulus worked last time without generating a huge amount of inflation for various reasons. But then, as Carmel was saying earlier, um, you know, very much more money in people's pockets at the moment because of the way that stimulus has been directed during COVID um, makes it more likely that inflation will be an outcome in this case. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um, uh, Professor Fullenkamp, you mentioned uh, when I was asking you about infrastructure, about labour, and we are having a, a labour shortage. How much do we know from figures from the Labour Department elsewhere about where those people are going? Are they going back to school? Are they in retirement? Are they just kind of staying home and waiting for the situation to improve? How much do we know about that? those labour shortages? Great. Yeah, it's, it's actually quite a mix. Um, one of the things that we have seen is, is there have been an accelerated number of retirements. And we're so we're talking really, you know, a shortage of workers somewhere in uh, the neighborhood of five million people, which uh, doesn't, you know, is is still a significant share of the active labor force. Um, and a great number of those folks have decided to just permanently retire. Now, uh, they they may say that now and be drawn back into the labor force eventually. And we did see a lot of that happening in the later stages of the economic boom before the pandemic. But that, again, remains to be seen. I mean, we do have an, an aging labor force and a lot of people are going to be retiring and some people just decided to do that sooner. Um, the other thing uh, that is happening, which is quite interesting, is that a lot of people have taken this time of the pandemic and the lockdowns to kind of rethink the type of work that they want to do and what we're seeing. Uh, and, and I've seen some statistics on this that a lot of people are just striking out on their own to um, start their own businesses, which on the one hand, it can be really good. But on the other hand, um, these tend to be really small and they don't tend to employ a lot of folks. 
Um, and, and we'd still do, as you, as you indicated, have lots of people who are, for various reasons, really unable to return to the labor force. They're still uh, wary of going back to work and being exposed to the virus. We have a lot of people who are still um, being slammed by the lack of, of child care or uh, school situations. And that is still really preventing a lot of people as well. So it's a mixture. It's a really interesting mixture. And again, it, um, there's no... Um, there's no really great policy, single policy prescription that we can get all of these folks back to work. And, and uh, I think, uh, you know, especially when it comes to the fact of accelerated retirement, we might just have to, to learn to live with that and find uh, other ways to, uh, to, to get around that in the labor force or with a labor shortage. Sure, you talk uh, about ways to get around it. Professor Raziel, I wanna hear what you've got to say. And I also want to ask you, because we've had a question in the Q and A, wondering whether um, this labor shortage could affect in any way um, how the government measures, approaches measures regarding immigration. And I'm wondering if economic history tells us anything about whether we've seen um, immigration laws you know, relax as a result of a labor shortage and a desperate need for that. So please go ahead and make the point you wanna make and then I'd like to hear your thoughts on that too. Absolutely, so you know, as Paul said, um, there has been some increased earlier retirement going on because of everything that happened with COVID. One, let, let's come back though to the inflation picture for a moment. Um, most retirees, Will tend to have uh, will tend to be using their savings in, in order to live during retirement. But if we do go into a more inflationary environment, suddenly those savings are not going to uh, be sufficient, or they may assume that they won't be sufficient. Especially because you know we all live so much longer these days. Um, so inflation eroding the value of people's retirement savings account may actually have the positive benefit at the margin of, of bringing some of those early retirees who are able to work back to work because they, they realize that their savings won't be able to carry them through their expected retirement if inflation goes up. Um, so that could be a, a benefit. And um, I'm sorry, Greg, you had another question, remind me. Sure, absolutely. I was asking about whether uh, economic history shows us whether um, a labor shortage could have any effect on government approaches to immigration. This was a question we had in the Q&A. Um, I think I'm actually going to turn that one over to Connell, more his area than mine. Sure. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, it, it would be nice to say that uh, labor shortages, uh, at least in recent economic history, have had that kind of an impact. But really what has had the most what has had the most profound impact on uh, our immigration policy, I think in the last half, half a century is uh, a, a fix for running out of money for social security. Um, I'm old enough to remember back in the eighties that uh, we had a big scare with social security and it running out of money. Uh, that was uh, the famous Greenspan report. I don't think it was in the mid eighties. And uh, one of the ways we, we responded to that was actually to loosen uh, the immigration policy and the thought was that that would allow a lot of new workers into the system and they would pay into social security. And that actually did, that's exactly what happened. So I think we have a much better shot at uh, changing immigration policy based on uh, considerations like that than actual labor shortages. Um, the, there's still just, uh, there's still too much, I think, resistance at many local levels for allowing a lot of, a lo a lot of new immigrant labor in even, um, even if it's really sorely needed. And, you know, we don't just see that in the US. It's, it's really interesting. Um, if, you look at the, if you look at Britain, they've had a lot of um, problems with the fact that Brexit has uh, curtailed the, the work visas of a lot of uh, European Union residents. And that meant a lot of folks who were filling low, uh, low wage jobs in, in Britain had to leave. And so they're having labor shortages there as well. Um, so it, it doesn't, that doesn't seem to be sufficient to really change uh, immigration policy, unfortunately. Sure, thank you both for that. We're going to wrap up here fairly soon. We've got a few more questions to get through. Um, Professor Raziel, I wanted to come back to a comment you made in your opening about how um, you know most people uh, taking care of their finances right now um, weren't doing so when during the last period of inflation because it was several decades ago. What should people who have never been in charge of their personal finances through something like this uh, be thinking about? What are some of the effects um, you know from that last meaningful period of inflation in the nineteen seventies? I think w one of the things that we would encourage people to try to do is, is, is to not panic. Um, so uh, when life becomes very uncertain, uh, people tend to become much more short-term focused. You know, how are we going to get through the next few weeks or months rather than thinking about the longer term, which is how we behave when we sort of feel more secure about our, 
our finances and about the future. Um, so not panicking could, um, you know, specifics of that, try not to do, uh, don't make dramatic changes to long-term retirement portfolios. Um, you know, panic often has people coming out, for example, of more risky investments and putting it into savings. Um, I would sort of strongly recommend not doing that. Uh, in fact, long-term portfolio, say retirement portfolios, keeping those in things like equities, which do actually tend to keep up a lot better with in inflation than savings accounts do. So, so don't panic on the retirement savings, uh, on the retirement investment accounts. Um, try to avoid the hoarding that we sometimes see of non-perishable essentials, because if uh, everybody goes out and buys in huge numbers, those because they're concerned about the prices going up, that will actually force the prices to go up more. One of the big risks of moving into an inflationary environment is that it uh, tends to feed on itself if people make panic short-term decisions and if people can remain somewhat calmer, not panic buy, not massively restructure the way they think about their um, investments for the future, um, that, that in itself will reduce the impact of inflation. Um, in, inflation is, is self-fulfilling in many ways. If everybody believes there will be inflation, there will be. And if people can be a little bit more relaxed about that, we will, through our, our own behavior, tend to mute the impact of inflation. Sure. Yeah. Professor Camp, um, as you follow up on that, we've had another question come in that, that asks how the most vulnerable communities, like, for example, you know, Latino communities, other immigrant communities, those who are the most economically vulnerable, what, if anything, can they do to prepare for any oncoming economic hardship? Yeah, um, I just want to add one more thing to Emma's comment, which is that, that in the past, when we've seen high inflation, people come out of the woodwork offering so-called inflation hedge investments whether it's gold or, you know, these days people are even advocating cryptocurrencies. I, I, just, to, just to echo what Emma said, don't fall for it. There are very, very few commodity or other magical uh, inflation hedge investments. So please don't fall for that and stay the course and stick with the, the good long-term investments uh, like, like equities, as Emma said. Um, if, if we pivot to thinking about how people uh, on a day-to-day -day basis can, can deal with economic hardship, I mean, it's, it's it, you know, it really is... Um, difficult when you've got limited amount of, of income to start with. So, um, you know, as economists, we, we often think that uh, people at the, at the bottom end of the income distribution are forced by the circumstances to be, you know, hyper rational, even more, they think more carefully about the individual purchases and decisions that they make. Um, and so I think, you know, here, um, the, 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 you know, the best strategy is uh, always to ha try to have something set aside for a rainy day, but I realize in many, many cases that's not possible. I follow um, the numbers on, uh, of the, uh, the, numbers on p the families in America who live paycheck to paycheck, and it's an astoundingly high number. I mean, it's, it's routinely uh, around 50%, 60% of the population. It's been falling a bit because of the pandemic relief, but there's still just, uh, just large numbers of families that, uh, that live paycheck to paycheck. In these situations, really the best, uh, the best strategy is to, um, is to have a support network of, of people who, uh, who you, can, uh, you can count on to help out, whether it w is with uh, helping out with uh, the grocery bill or, 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 pooling, or pooling resources together uh, to, to fend off emergencies. But re really that is the, the, main, the main source of support that really we all have uh, in the end. Sure, thank you. Um, something I wanted to get both your perspectives on, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the last period of sustained um, inflation back in the 1970s. And of course, that was followed by double digit unemployment and a recession in the 1980s. Obviously, circumstances today are very different and unusual. But um, how likely is it that we should expect that if there is a period of sustained inflation, that there is going to be a, a similar kind of crash afterwards with those those similar effects? Or is today right so different that it's just impossible to say what would happen? Professor Raziel, what, what are your thoughts on that? I, mean, I think it is, it is incredibly hard to say what will happen because the situation is very different. There, there are circumstances into which inflation does drive huge unemployment. And then we have something that, like the 1970s, which was referred to as stagflation, where you had both high uh, inflation and high unemployment, and that became a kind of vicious cycle. But that's not inevitable. It doesn't have to end up like that. And I think 
you know, what Carmel and I have both been saying earlier is if people don't panic, if, if people um, try to keep a, a medium to long term view and don't stockpile and don't, uh, you know, panic about what's happening, we can make it through an inflationary period a lot more calmly. The one other thing I would say is, you know, we we're all fairly poor at at budgeting, uh, just about thinking about what are our essential costs that we must fulfill every month with our paycheck versus what we spend money on in a discretionary uh, way. I would say one of the most important things people can do, especially those who do have more limited income, is to really tamp down on their desire for short term uh, buying of, of just something that, that pops into their email feed that, that looks or, or onto the website that, gee, I would really like one of those um, to try to avoid that, to, to try to restrain themselves from uh, spending money that they don't need to spend. So being a more careful budgeter coming into an inflationary environment will help both for individuals and, again, to some extent, it may help mute the extent to which inflation increases. Sure, thank you. Professor Fullenkamp, any other kind of closing thoughts to add there? Well, I think when we look back into history, especially that inflationary period in the in the seventies, um, the 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 need to um, really get the inflation expectations out of the system was really what drove monetary policy to clamp down so hard on, on the money growth rate and the money supply at that time. And that's really what drove the the uh, the reaction uh, with high unemployment and the deep recession that we had in 1982. Um, so I, the, the lesson to me is that what we really need to do is to try to, as much as we can, prevent uh, inflation expectations from getting embedded into the system uh, like they did back in the 70s. And, and there are certainly things that we can do. And I know the Biden administration is trying to take some steps, but there are, you know, there are steps that they could take that are even broader, more big picture. Um, they may not necessarily like some of the steps that I'm going to suggest, but one of the things that, that we can always look at are things like um, uh, de deregulation and loosening of restrictions that allow more uh, businesses to form, allow more expansion. We really need to encourage uh, the the uh, innovation and productivity in the economy. Those things will also help to fight inflation. Uh, but those things are, are, are also like everything else. They're not magic balls. They don't happen overnight. Um, I think one of the things that we really do need to, to uh, do in the short term, which we can do, is uh, take our foot off the accelerator, uh, especially in terms of monetary policy, but also in terms of fiscal policy, and at least let up on the, the, the inflationary pressures and let the ones that are already in the system try to percolate through and work themselves out. So um, one of the best things we can do right now is just not to make the situation worse by adding fuel to the fire. Sure, absolutely. And just to, to follow up on a point you made there, you talked about um, trying to avoid getting inf inflation expectation embedded. Um, and I guess to an extent you just addressed it, but I mean, is there anything that we can do or is that something that kind of just tends to happen automatically as the economy kind of grinds on? Well, I, I think Emma can address this a little bit better, but I, I really think it has to do with, you know, if you see, if you see inflation going up all the time, and if you see these uh, mechanisms getting uh, put into, you know, if, if people are getting automatic uh, raises at work based on inflation and things like that, I mean, I think people are very savvy about picking up on those clues. So it, it really, it, it, part of it is that we really need to uh, get past this, this, short period of inflation, make it, make it as short as we can, do whatever we can to make the period of inflation short rather than letting it drag on. So Professor Razzi, only thing to add on how, uh, how we keep inflation short. I'm sure if that was an easy thing, then everybody would do it. Uh, um, but one of the things, again, coming back to the behavioral stuff, um, the way that we all think is that the more we hear about something, the more we believe it. So ironically, given that this is a talk about inflation, um, if, if we weren't hearing day in, day out about people's concerns for inflation, um, people would be less concerned about it. Um, so it, it, it clearly a sort of paradoxical effect, but, but if people can try again, try not to panic about it, try not to assume that this, this big, huge looming inflation concern is the biggest thing that we have to worry about, that in itself may help to, to break it and keep it a, uh, a, a relatively shorter cycle. And, and the one other thing that I'll say is the changes that the Connor was talking about in policy and so on, 
those things cannot possibly change everything overnight. We're, we're very short term focused uh, these days, partly because of social media and for all sorts of other reasons. But if, if people just can allow um, allow the, the economic situation to evolve without jumping to huge conclusions and wondering why it's not getting solved tomorrow, um, that can kind of calm things down. Sure, thank you. And um, we have had another question come in that I wanted to ask you guys because it's super interesting. We're talking about how we've got um, uh, historic inflation happening in Europe also. And so when we have a kind of potentially global situation here, I guess uh, the, the question is, A, how do these other economies affect what's happening in the US? And B, is there much we can do from a policy perspective if we are in a global kind of situation of inflation? Is it just that we're all on, we're all floating down the same lazy river? Um, I'll, I'll say a couple of things and then and then turn over to Connell. Um, surprisingly, but you know, because of both the Great Recession, but also because of COVID and various other factors, where uh, the globe is less global in some ways than it was um, 2006, 2007. Um, a lot of um, supply and manufacturing and so on has been brought back into the U.S. or in other countries has been brought back into their own country. So I don't think we're tied in lockstep to the rest of the globe. I think that the policies that the US comes up with will have a bigger impact on the US, while the policies that, that European and other parts of the world, uh, their own policies will have differential effects in their own countries. Well, thank you, Professor Fullenkamp. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I'll pick up on that uh, that point in particular uh, momentarily. I think one of the one of the interesting differences that is uh, driving a lot of the inflation in Europe that we're seeing is they they have a really strong commitment to uh, decarbonization in their economies, and in some ways that's really coming and in, inviting them right now because um, one of the things that is responsible for the inflation in Europe is the ri big rise in energy prices. And part of the big rise in energy prices is, is occurring because they made this big push to switch to renewables that um, actually it hasn't, hasn't worked out quite as, uh, quite as nicely as they had, had hoped. And so they're falling back on more traditional fossil fuels and, and bidding those prices up because they simply uh, just haven't arranged for, their, for adequate supplies. Uh, and I use that as a point to, to kind of emphasize what Emma is saying is that, yes, there is global inflation. And yes, some of the causes are similar, like the, the supply chain problems. Um, but, but it really does turn out to be uh, influenced very heavily by local policies. And that is certainly one big way that uh, the U.S. is very different from Europe. Um, we're just we're slower in coming up on the on the, the greening of the economy. And at this point, that's actually been a benefit because it's given us uh, more flexibility to deal with rising prices. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and thank you both. I think we'll leave it there. It's been a fascinating discussion. I've certainly learned a lot. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks to our panellists, Connell Fullenkamp and Emma Raziel, for sharing your expertise. Uh, I guess if we've learned anything over the last two years, hopefully we've learned you should just buy the amount of toilet paper that you need and only when you need it. And perhaps that can help the economy. Uh, we will be back on Friday at 10 when we'll be talking um, with some of our vaccine specialists about the new Omicron variant. If you'd like to be notified about that and other Duke media briefings, please email Duke News at duke.edu or if you're watching on YouTube, just like and subscribe. In the meantime, please uh, stay safe and have a great day. Thank you so much.